Clang, clang, clang went the trolley. And when it went, a whole era went with it. Most people thought it was an inevitable sign of progress. On the contrary, it was largely a result of a criminal conspiracy. General Motors, Firestone Tires, Standard Oil of California, and some others wanted to see cars and buses burning gasoline and rubber on a lot of new highways. It would be good for General Motors, therefore presumably good for America. They moved in dozens of cities to wreck the old electric transit systems. We've picked Los Angeles, the heaven and the hell of the American automobile, to show what they wrought. Well, Bruce, the Rush Hour Rodeo is definitely well underway. North of Slauson, there's a hit and split accident. San Diego Los Angeles freeways are a wonder of the world. No other community in history has ever attempted anything like them. They drape gracefully among the dunes and hills of the desert, like spaghetti in a meat sauce of urban sprawl. They have a kind of functional stark beauty if you're looking at them from the air. Of course, you can't see them from the air a lot of days because of the smog. The trouble is that since the first one was opened on December 30th, 1940, every one has been obsolete on the day it was dedicated. The freeways are at best monotonous, at worst intolerable. Last year, some drivers began dealing with their stress by shooting other drivers. Drive time was not significantly reduced. The people out there who still believe in the automobile have now quite seriously proposed double-decking all of L.A.'s freeways. Wouldn't it be nice, some people thought, if Los Angeles had some streetcars? But Los Angeles used to have streetcars, a lot of them. Believe it or not, L.A. had the biggest and best streetcar system in the United States. On over a thousand miles of track, in cars like this, it hauled over a hundred million people a year, as early as 1920. At one time during the war, they ran 2,800 scheduled runs a day. And they were leaving 6th and Main many times at one and a half minute intervals. So we carried an awful lot of people. They called them the big red cars, and Gordon Bates was a motorman on one of them. Disguised as a private first class, I was an occasional passenger, so I share the nostalgia, which Gordon satisfies, by operating leftover Big Reds on two miles of track at the Orange Empire Railway Museum east of Los Angeles, showing today's deprived kids how it was. Were people happy with them? Oh, definitely. Very happy with them. In fact, the conductor's main job was waking the people up to get them off at their stations. <laughs> Not everyone slept. Gordon remembers watching a few romances flourish on the Long Beach line. Nothing like that ever happened to me. But it happened to Judy Garland. Clang, clang, clang went the trolley. Ding, ding, ding went the bell. Ding, ding, ding went my heart strings. From the moment I saw him, I fell. Judy sang that in 1944, and just about in time. The trolleys had begun to disappear. It wasn't progress, and it wasn't suicide. It was murder by conspiracy. That was the conclusion of a federal jury upheld on appeal. The way it worked was that General Motors, Firestone Tire, and Standard Oil of California, and some other companies, depending on the location of the target, would arrange financing for an outfit called National City Lines which cozied up to city councils and county commissioners and bought up transit systems like L.A.'s. Then they would junk or sell the electric cars and pry up the rails for scrap, and beautiful modern buses would be substituted. Buses made by General Motors and running on Firestone tires and burning standards gas. Didn't anybody notice? Well, we heard the rumors, like everybody else did, that uh, General Motors and Firestone and Standard Oil and all that as far as we're concerned, it was strictly rumors. Los Angeles Mayor Tom Bradley is one of the people who remembers. I dare say you could go around the city and you wouldn't find more than a dozen people who were aware that there was such a charge of conspiracy. The conspiracy didn't hit Los Angeles until the end of World War II. A month after the new owners took over, the Transit Company, 237 new buses arrived. This followed a year in which the electric lines had made a million and a half dollars and carried over 200 million passengers. 
By the end of GM's motorization campaign in 1955, almost 90% of the streetcars were gone from America's cities, including Los Angeles. William Dixon put together the criminal conspiracy case that the federal government brought against GM and the others in 1947. At 84, he's the only principal in that case still alive. There was nothing you could do to bring back the streetcars. No, nothing, not a thing. You're, you're absolutely right, you're, yes. The conspirators had managed in the decade from 1936 to 1946 to dismantle streetcar lines in 45 cities. The key to the federal case was intent. Did the defendants just go along with a national trend, or did they destroy electric mass transit on purpose? The juries and the judges said they were big boys, and they knew what they were doing. But Dixon thinks the punishment was ridiculous. The government had asked that individual corporate officers be sent to jail. The government did not get it, much to my surprise, surprise and personal disgust. What was the punishment for the individuals? <laughs> Well, the judge said this was nothing more than a traffic violation by the defendants, and he imposed a $1 fine on the de uh, individual defendants as punishment. The corporations, on the other hand, were given the maximum penalty, a $5,000 fine. General Motors sold something like $25 million of equipment to National City Lines. <laughs> they paid $5,000 penalty. That's not a bad deal. <laughs> No, that's an excellent deal. Maybe the worst thing is that the conspirators left no room for later second thoughts. In Los Angeles, they tried to make sure that the streetcars would be gone for good. They started pulling tracks just as fast as they get the crews out there to pull them. Some old streetcars were sold to less automobile-mad cities abroad, but most of them were just piled up in junkyards. And this idiocy seemed to make sense even to people who weren't making any money out of it. A few of the cars were saved and lovingly restored by volunteers in museums around the country, like the Orange Empire. On Saturdays there, the public comes in to rediscover the old sensible joys of the trolley. Not all the trolleys are in museums. A few cities, like New Orleans and Philadelphia, never gave theirs up, and they're feeling pretty smug about that now. More dramatically, some other cities have bitten the bullet and resumed service, gone back to the future. Like San Diego, for instance. They've been running trolleys since 1981 and adding new routes constantly. It seems to work unbelievably well. Listen to San Diego's mayor, Maureen O'Connor. Everybody in San Diego loves the trolley. The only problem now, Harry, is we can't get them into the neighborhoods fast enough. They're a clean, efficient system, and they're very cost-effective. Particularly in Los Angeles, but to some extent all over the country, some people are, say that Americans won't give up their God-given right to drive their own cars. Have you run into that in, in San Diego? People are giving up their second cars and they are commuting to work on the trolleys. We have statistics that show that. It's not just the senior citizen in the low-income household, but it's the uh, uh, professionals that are well that are using the trolley. Have the trolleys made a measurable difference in the traffic problem? In the South Bay area, there's no question. If we didn't have a trolley, there'd be gridlock. So you'd recommend them to any other mayor looking for a, an issue? I absolutely would, because bottom line, not only they're good for the city, and they're cheap, they're fun. At last count, 19 other American cities, including Portland, Oregon, and Seattle, as well as Los Angeles, are following San Diego's lead. After repeatedly turning down mass transit plans at the polls, L.A.'s laid-back citizens finally approved. They started digging a central subway line, which will connect to a lot of trolleys. They call them light rail lines now. And the interesting thing is that the very routes, the 1,100-mile uh, system that the old red cars used to run are almost the precise lines where they want to put the uh, metro rail and the light rail system. As late as 1955, streetcars used to run up the middle of the Hollywood freeway. That right away has been destroyed, taken out, closed down, sold off. And so we now had to buy property along those routes at very high cost. Los Angeles and the, and the country as a whole are progressing rapidly backwards. Yes, yes, we're reaching the point where we used to be 20, 30, 40 years ago. In left behind spots around Los Angeles are evidences of what the city is now slowly trying to replace. This tunnel downtown, for instance, 
It carried streetcars roughly to where the new tunnel will when it's finished at a cost of unimaginable hundreds of millions of dollars. They can't use this one because supports for buildings and freeways were drilled into it along the route. It just sits here. The cars and buses crawl slowly overhead. Those buses, by the way, are still mostly GM buses. But GM declined to comment on this story because it sold its bus division last summer, making the question of GM's past activities, they say, moot. Just possibly the idea of clean, efficient mass transportation is an idea whose time has come again. It's clear that they will have to get out of the automobile. They simply won't be able to move unless there is a, a rapid transit system. So yes, I think they're going to quickly adapt to that new means of transportation. So maybe in the 1990s, the Judy Garland or Madonna of the moment will make a new love song for the Los Angeles trolleys. And it was grand just to stand with his hand holding one. 